Welcome to Math 150, Calc 3, Lecture 9. What we're going to be doing today is doing problems on optimization. All right, so the big question is how do we find maxima and minima of functions? I believe in this class I have already run into one of the side walls. Yes? Good. Uh, my right arm might actually be broken. I'm beginning to think it's not tennis elbow. And so I'm glad I do not need to do this again. Why did I run into the wall for you guys? What was this to remind you of? Yes? To check the boundaries. To check the boundaries. So in one dimension, checking the boundaries is not a big deal. You basically have two points to check. This is a, a very reasonable ask. In several variables, however, the boundaries are going to be infinite sets. And it's a lot more involved. So the first thing is, how do we find maximum and minimum? Well, the first thing is the first derivative test. So if I give you some function f of x, we often look at critical points, places where the first derivative is 0. Unfortunately, the first derivative being 0 is not enough to ensure that we have a maximum or minimum. It gives us candidates. It doesn't give us certainties. So the standard function is to take f of x as x cubed. And so if I take that, then f prime of x is 3x squared. So the critical point is f prime of x equals 0. So x equals 0. If we plot this function, however, we see that the function does not have a maximum or a minimum at x equals 0. And what goes wrong is if you look at the second derivative, uh, it's going to be 6x. And the second derivative also vanishes at 0. f double prime of 0 equals 0. So the first derivative being 0 is a necessary condition for a maximum or minimum, but it is not a sufficient condition. Can somebody give me a necessary condition for passing this course? Nope. Doing the homework is not a necessary condition for passing the course. The amount that the homework counts is not enough. Yeah, what did you say? No. Well, I, uh, nope. Nope. I'm sorry, nope. Really basic. Registering and being actually enrolled in the course. You cannot pass this course unless you're enrolled in the course. Do you think being enrolled in this course is sufficient to ensure you pass? No. Right? Now we can talk about some sufficient conditions. You know, passing all the exams, that's a sufficient condition for passing to ensure that you pass the course. So we want to figure out when do we have not just a candidate, but when do we actually have a maximum or a minimum. And so the first thing we do is the first derivative test. And so you might have seen plots like this before. I'll draw f prime down here. And here's my critical point 0. And let's say f prime looks like this. So it's positive to the right of the critical point, and it's negative before. If the first derivative is positive, what does that tell you about the function? It's increasing. So could this be a maximum? No, because the function is getting larger as I go to the right. Could it be a minimum? Yeah, it's getting larger as I go to the right. And if I go to the left, if the first derivative is decreasing, then my function is getting smaller. So if I were to plot this, this is curve sketching, here's x. It's going to look something like this. It gets smaller as I come to x0, and then it gets larger. So the first derivative gives me a sense of the shape of the graph. Now, instead of the first derivative test, we could do the second derivative test. So imagine now we don't know what f prime is. But we know that f prime is 0 at x0. It's a critical point. And imagine the second derivative is positive at x0. And we'll assume the second derivative is continuous. So if it's continuous, if it's positive at x0, what must be true just a little bit past x0? What must be true about the second derivative? So if it's positive at x0, what must be true a little bit past x0? It's got, it still has to be positive. If this was 17, then if I go a little bit to the right, it still has to be positive. Maybe it's 13.2. Maybe it's falling fast. 
but it's still going to be positive for at least a little bit. What if I go a little bit before x0? If it was positive at x0, what must be true a little bit before x0? What must it be? It's still positive, right? It's continuous. So because we're assuming the second derivative is continuous, if it's positive at x0, it's got to be positive to the left and to the right. Now, there are many ways to view the second derivative. I can view it as the derivative of the derivative. Why do I want to view it like this? Well, the first derivative tells you if the function is increasing or decreasing. So f prime tells me if f is increasing or decreasing. What function will f double prime speak of? f prime tells us about f. Uh, it tells you how fast it's increasing. Which function? Um, f double prime tells you of f prime. Good. So f double prime tells us about f prime. So if f double prime is positive, what must be true about f prime near this point? If f double prime is always positive, what must be true about f prime in this region? It's increasing. So if it's 0 here, what must be true about a little bit to the right? Okay, it's got to be greater than 0. <laughs> Similarly, it's increasing, and it's 0 at x0. What must be true before x0? Mm -hmm. has to be negative, because it's increasing. If it was positive, it can't increase to 0. Oh, look, the second derivative test really just gave us back the first derivative. It's just a really convenient way. For the first derivative test, you have to look at what's going on in the neighborhood. For the second derivative test, by just looking at the second derivative, it tells us what the first derivative looks like in a neighborhood, so we know it has to look something like this. Okay. So this is the second derivative test. How many of you have seen this before in a calculus class? You have to remember which way things go. And so I'm going to show you a quick way to qu uh, remember what the positive or the negative value of the second derivative tells you. One of the things I love in life is that frequently you have an approximate remembrance, an approximate idea of what a result is, but you're a little bit hazy on some of the details. If you know a lot of it, you can often correct and see the rest of it. Uh, I took my family out to... Um, Water Street Grill last night, and there was a sign from with a picture of Abraham Lincoln drinking. And it was, I think, you know, four score and four thousand beers ago we started our freshman year in college. And then that was in big letters, and then in smaller letters it was Abraham Lincoln. And we were having a discussion: can we actually read the, and see that it says Abraham Lincoln? And we were split on whether or not we could actually read. What we could do is we could see that there was this giant picture of somebody who looked like Lincoln with a quote that looked a lot like a college version of the Gettysburg Address. And we saw a name with some of the letters looking a lot like Abraham Lincoln. And from that, we could just correct and fill in and say, OK, it's got to be Abraham Lincoln. I want you to be able to do something similar to that, not drink 4,000 beers, but being able to look at something and say, I have a rough idea of what it is. Let me fill this in and figure out what it should be. Can somebody give me a really simple function that has a minimum? x squared. And somebody give me a really simple function that has a maximum. Minus, Minus x squared. And you can see the two over there from earlier today. All right. f prime of x is 2x. g prime of x is negative 2x. The critical point where the first derivative is 0 is just x equals 0. This also has a critical point at x equals 0. The second derivative, however, is 2. And so the second derivative at 0 is positive. Over here, the second derivative is minus 2. And the second derivative at 0 is negative. So here is my function f. And it's a minimum. Here is my function g. And it's a maximum. So if you remember that there is such a thing as the second derivative test, well, now all you have to do, if you're not sure which way it goes, check it on the upward and the downward parabolas. It's very easy to calculate which way they're going. Is it a maximum minimum? 
And once you know what's going on from these, then you can fill in what's going on in the more general case. So really, what's going on? How many of you have seen Taylor series? OK, so you are not required to have seen Taylor series for this class. We will be doing Taylor series later. Uh, it is absolutely wonderful that all the different schools have slightly different calculus programs. So we don't have a unified set of things that everybody has seen. The main idea in Calc 1 is if I give you some function, I try to approximate it locally with a line. And the tangent line usually does a good job, at least locally, at least if you don't go too far. What do you think might do better than a line? A curve. A curve. What curve? A parabola. A parabola. And what might do better than a parabola? Uh, a cubic. A cubic. Yeah. And then better than a cubic would be a quartic. The more terms we have, the better we should be able to do. Why? Because a line is a degenerate quadratic. It's just a quadratic with the x squared term being 0. A quadratic is a degenerate cubic. So maybe what we do is we replace locally our function with a parabola. And we try to figure out what is the best parabola. And what Taylor series does is your function f of x is approximately f of 0 plus f prime of 0 times x plus f double prime of 0 over 2 factorial x squared. So this would be a second order approximation. Why is this a good approximation? Well, if I take x equals 0, the left hand side is f of 0. And the right-hand side is f of 0. So the two sides agree at 0. Let's look at the instantaneous rate of change. If I take the derivative of the right-hand side, this is a constant, so it goes away. This becomes a 2x, and at x equals 0, this vanishes. And so the derivative of this side at is just going to be f prime of 0 when x equals 0. It has the same value as the derivative of the left-hand side at 0. If we take two derivatives of both sides, this vanishes because it's a constant. This vanishes because I take two derivatives and it's only an x. This, and now you can see why I'm writing 2 factorial. I'm going to get 2 times 1. And I'll just get f double prime of 0, which is the same over here. So I've set things up so that they have the same value, first and second derivative. If I'm at a critical point, what's true about this? It's 0. So what that's saying is that if I have a critical point, well, all I am doing here is f of 0 is just shifting things up and down. Right, so I have worked, I think, a little bit in section 1. If I move this table up and down, am I changing anything relative on the table? No, everything on the table is just moving all together. Am I changing how it is relative to the floor? Absolutely. But the relative changing of all the chalk, and the iPad, that doesn't move as I move this up and down. So all this f of 0 does is it just moves everything up and down. What this is saying is near a critical point, our function looks a lot like a parabola. Which parabola? Oh, it's the nice parabolas we were just talking about a moment ago. If this is positive, it's going to be an upward sloping parabola, and it's going to be a minimum. If the second derivative is negative, it's going to be a downward pointing parabola, and it's going to be a maximum. If we go on to several variables, there is a generalization of the second derivative test. What class would be useful here? Linear algebra. Linear algebra. And so there's terrible conditions that when you see them in a Calc 3 book, you want to scream. Uh, so I have to memorize this. When you learn linear algebra, then it becomes a much better way of looking at it. And it makes sense what the second derivative test becomes. In Calc 3 right now, the condition becomes a little bit unnatural. What we're going to do now is we're going to try to find ways to search for maxima and minima. That's the big goal for this part of the course. We want to try to figure out where is our function largest and smallest. When you're searching for something, what is the first thing you should establish? When yeah, when you're looking for something, what's the first thing you should establish when you're looking for something? Related to that, not quite what it is. So that's not bad. Where you're looking for it. Nope. I will give extra credit to the first person who can give me a unicorn that can whistle Dixie, play chess, and run the 500 
meters. So if it exists. So if it exists, right? Before you start looking for something, make sure it exists. If it doesn't exist, it's not going to be a fruitful search. How many of you have heard George Carlin's routines? So I actually let my kids listen to the uncut George Carlin. He does sometimes use strong words, but in a lot of his routines, he uses them in a great way. And he has a wonderful routine on the airlines and how airline people do not understand the English language. And he goes through all the different places where they do not understand what words mean. He goes, look, these two planes, they nearly missed. What's a near miss? If two planes nearly miss each other, they, it's a collision. So when you talk about a near miss, that's actually a bad event. Then they, they say, check your immediate seating vicinity for any items you may have brought on board. I may have brought on board my grand piano, but I didn't, so I'm not going to look for it. I'm going to look for the items I did bring on board. That's what I want you to be thinking about for all of the stuff on optimization. We're looking for the stuff that actually exists. How do we know these things exist? What class is going to teach us that these things exist? No, this is one of the few times all semester when linear algebra is the wrong answer. Real it's real analysis. So real analysis will actually prove to you that your searches are not in vain. Okay. Otherwise, you could spend a lot of time trying to find a maximum or minimum, and there may not be one. So in some situations, I can very quickly and very easily show you that there is not going to be a maximum or a minimum. So one of the easiest examples is let's take f of x equals 1 over x, 0 less than x less than 1. So here's 0, here's 1. Does this function have a maximum? So x is strictly between 0 and 1. Is there a value of x that gives a value of f that is larger than every other value? Yes. So what would that value of x be? Yes. No. Right? If you give me any value of x, say you give me 1 over 1,000, I'll say, okay, I'll take 1 over 1,000 and 1. So fine, I'll take 1 over a billion. Okay, I'll go 1 over a billion and 1. There is no value of x that gives a larger value than any other value, than every other value. Is there a, a value of x where the, where the function is the smallest? No, as I keep taking x closer and closer to 1, it's going to get smaller and smaller. If I include 1, now all of a sudden it does have a smallest value. So these are the things we need to be careful about when we are doing our searches. You know, we want to make sure that the search will work, that we can find things. And so in real analysis, we will learn language about open sets and closed sets. And when you have I'm not going to worry too much about that in this class. I'm going to just assume that we are in situations. A lot of times from physical grounds, you know that there will be a maximum or minimum. When we do the farmer brown problem, there's clearly a minimum. No area by just doing stupid dimensions for the fence. All right. So constrained maxima. So there are two things we need to look at. For constrained maxima, that's where we're looking at the surface. So maybe I have to live inside a sphere or an ellipsoid or something like that, and I want to see where is my function larger given that I'm living on that <coughs> sphere. We're ignoring the interior. And the reason we're ignoring the interior is the interior is actually very easy. In one variable calculus, how did we find the candidates for the maximum minima in the interior? Critical, Critical points. So for the interior, these are the derivative of f, or the gradient of f, or um, grad f equals zero. You know, all different ways of writing the derivative. So for instance, df dx, df dy, 
dfz equals zero, zero, zero. And the reason is if I'm at some point, if df dx is not zero, well then if I move in that direction, my function, let's say df dx is positive, my function would be larger in that direction and smaller in the other direction, so I can't be at a maximum or a minimum. So we're just using our old knowledge from Calc 1 that for the interior, we just have to find places <coughs> where df dx, df dy, df dz is zero, zero, zero. So the interior is not that bad. It's the same stuff we did before. It's a little bit more complicated now because we now have three equations. But it's not more complicated from a calculus perspective. Which perspective is it worse now? Algebra. Algebra. And the biggest problem people often have in calculus is not the calculus. The amount of calculus we do is really small. The amount of algebra we then need to do to actually simplify this and get something nice is tremendous. And that's where the difficulty is going to be. So this is how we deal with the interior. And then the boundary is more interesting. So here is some surface g of x equals some constant c. So if you want, you could think of maybe g of x, y, z is x squared plus y squared plus z squared minus 4 equals 0. What surface would that be? x squared plus y squared plus z squared minus 4 equals 0. So what surface is this? Surface of a sphere with radius. Sorry? Two. two. So it's a sphere, radius 2. And I'm viewing this as the level set is going to have value 0. I could have written my function g of x, y, z as x squared plus y squared plus z squared, and I could have set that equal to 4, and that with the level set of 4. It doesn't really matter which way you want to do it. A lot of times we just always do it like this to make it a level set of 0. It makes no difference. And the reason is when we start taking derivatives, the derivative of any constant is 0. So the gradient of g is the normal to the surface. So at each point, it is pointing in a perpendicular direction. So over here, if this is my surface, the gradient of g is, per is pointing perpendicular to my surface. If I want to maximize or minimize a function, maybe I give you f of x, y, z, it's terrible y, equals 1,000 z, and g of x, y, z is x squared plus y squared plus z squared minus 4 equals 0. So I want to maximize um, this function subject to the constraint that I'm on the sphere. Where is this going to be largest? So when you look at this, where is this going to be largest? At the top, at the North Pole. I want z to be as large as possible. Where is it going to be smallest? So largest is going to be when z is equal to 2. The smallest will be when z is negative 2, negative two at the South Pole. So for this one, I can just quickly look at it and see what's going on. In general, if I look at the gradient of f, the gradient of f tells me the direction of the maximum change of the function. So if I move in the direction of the gradient of f, my function is increasing as fast as possible. Which direction would I go to see my function decrease as fast as possible? So the gradient of f, if I go in this direction, my function is increasing as fast as possible. Which way should I go to see my function decrease as fast as possible? Opposite. <coughs> so if I go in the opposite direction, like negative gradient of f, the function will be decreasing as fast as possible. So when I look at what's going on, you know, here is my surface, you know, g of x equals c. Here is the gradient of g. And now, well, that's not the gradient of g. 
if I take something tangent to the surface right there, then I would be staying on the surface. If I go back to the sphere example, would you like to take z equals phi? Sure, the function will be larger, but it's not gonna satisfy the constraint. So what the constraint does is it reels you in. I would love to keep moving in this direction. My function's increasing, but I'm not allowed to move in that direction if it takes me off the surface. So if I give you a general gradient of f, if the gradient of f has any component that is tangent to the surface, if it has any component that is not in the same direction as the gradient of g, then if you move in that direction, the function will be larger and you can still stay in the surface. I want to go in this direction to increase my function as fast as possible. I'm not allowed to go in that direction. It takes me off the surface. But I can go in this direction. And if I write this vector, I can write it as something in the direction of g and something in the direction of, the t of a tangent. Because the gradient of f is not fully aligned with the gradient of g, it's going to get a little bit larger if I move like this. And it's going to get a little bit smaller if I move in the opposite direction. It can't be a maximum or a minimum. So what's the only thing that could happen if I want to have a maximum or minimum? What direction must the gradient of f be? So what direction does the gradient of f have to point if I want to have a maximum or minimum? So we have gradient of g floating around. What must be true about the directions of the gradient of f and the gradient of g? The gradient of g is perpendicular to the surface. It has nothing in a direction of a tangent. So the gradient of f, how does it have to point? It has to line up with, has to line up with the gradient of g. That's the only way to make sure it has nothing that's tangent, nothing that allows it to keep increasing if you stay on the surface. It's gotta be, if I want a maximum or minimum, no matter how I move, if I stay in the surface, my function can't be getting larger if I wanna have a minimum. If I wanna have a maximum, no matter how I move, it can't, my cursor was very slow, okay. If I want it to be a minimum, no matter how I move, the function can't get small. If I want it to be a maximum, no matter how I move, it can't get larger. Well, if I had some component in this direction, then my function gets larger in this direction, which means it can't be a minimum, and it gets smaller in this direction, so it can't be a maximum. So the only thing that's left is the gradient of f has to point in the direction of the gradient of g if I want to have a chance of having a maximum or minimum. It doesn't mean that I will have a maximum or minimum. It just means that I have a chance of having a maximum or minimum. And so this leads to Lagrange multipliers. We are given the constraint g of x equals 0. And we want to find the max or the min of f of x subject to g of x equals 0. So we have to stay on the sphere. And so what the solution is, is we have the system of equations. We have g of x equals 0. And then we have the gradient of f at x is lambda times the gradient of g at x. So for example, in three dimensions, we have g of x, y, z equals 0, and the gradient of f at x, y, z equals lambda, gradient of g of x, y, z. When you first look at this, you should be weeping. How many equations do we have? How many equations does it look like we have? It looks like we have two equations. How many unknowns do we have? A little higher than three. Four. Four. We have the unknowns 
x, y, z, and lambda. Of the four of these, which are known as the least important? Lambda. At the end of the day, I care about where is my function largest or smallest. I care about x, y, z. Do I care about lambda? Not really. I only care about lambda as much as it can help me find x, y, and z. And this goes back to a general theme. Rather than doing one hard problem, do some smaller, simpler, easier problems. Who are my potential econ people? Okay, so in econ, they will talk occasionally about the interpretation of lambda. And then when you're solving these problems, lambda could actually be useful information to know. But the most important is x, y, z. It looks like we have more unknowns than equations, but how many equations is grad f equals lambda grad g? How many equations is that in three variables x, y, and z? How many components does the grad f have? How many? Three. Three. So you have three components here and three components. You actually have three equations. You have four equations and four unknowns. We also have df dx equals lambda dg dx dot 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 df dz equals lambda dg dz. So you do have four equations and four unknowns. There is a chance of being able to solve it. Anybody know what letter in English the Greek lambda corresponds to? Sorry? F. Not F. L. L. And so it's Lagrange multipliers. Think L and L. If you take linear algebra, they often use lambda for eigenvalues and eigenvectors. It's a very similar problem. So what we want to do now is we want to see how can we use this to solve problems. So I'm going to deliberately do a problem where we already know the answer, so we can check and see if this is reasonable, and where the algebra is going to be nice. The hardest part is doing the algebra as it probably gets worse and worse. So what was the book that was read to you in the video? Click, clack, moo, click, clack, moo cows that type. How many people have actually read Click, Clack, Moo? All right. There's a sequel to Click, Clack, Moo. There's multiple books in the series. It's a, fun, it's a fun series. And so Farmer Brown has a problem. Actually, I think Farmer Brown has many problems. But one of them is that he only considers rectangular pens for his cows. And he wants to maximize the area. And so you have maybe x plus y, which is the semi-perimeter is 20, and you want to maximize x times y. And the way we normally solve this is we say, well, it's the same as maximizing x times 20 minus x because we can solve for y in terms of x. This is the classic way to attack it. How would you find the derivative of this? What would you do? Distribute. Yeah, you would distribute. So for me, the patron saint of mathematics is Henry David Thoreau. What's Thoreau famous for? What works? Simplify, simplify, simplify. simplify. Well, actually, just simplify, simplify. You could simplify, simplify to simplify, but I think simplify, simplify just drives the point home. So what is simplify, simplify from? Which work of his? One of his two most famous works, I believe. Walden. Walden, yes. And I have actually jogged around Walden with one of my friends. I made the mistake of, after we finished telling her, oh, that wasn't so bad, and then having to do another lap around Walden Pond, at which point I said, I'm done. <laughs> What's his other real famous one? On civil disobedience is often another very famous essay of his, well worth reading. So what Thoreau would tell us here is, well, why the hell would you want to use the product rule? The product rule is painful. If we simplify this first, this is going to be much easier. And we'll say a of x is 20x 20 minus, 20 minus x squared. a prime of x is going to just be 20 minus 2x. So the critical point, a prime of x equals 0, that gives us x equals 10. Should I technically look at the second derivative and see if it's a maximum or minimum? What do you think? Should I look at the second derivative? Yes, right? However, for this problem, 
I think we've, we're convinced that this is going to be the maximum, not the minimum, and that the maximum exists. But if you want to be safe, a double prime of 10, it's going to just be negative 2. And if it's negative, is it a maximum or a minimum? And I'm just picturing the problem of negative x squared in my head right now. It's going to be maximum. So this is the calc one way, calc two way of doing the farmer brown problem. I'm not going to go into detail here, but just to put it in the video, I like the Farmer Bob variant where he's building along a water. And you imagine which superhero? Aquaman. Aquaman. And Aquaman is making a pen for his fish at the same time. And so really, it's as if you had twice as much fence, and the best solution is going to be a giant square. So this is going to be a square where the length is twice the width. And you want to always ask, you know, are your answers reasonable? We got a square. Do you think a square is a reasonable answer? If you had three sides, what, what do you think you would get? Be more specific. There's a lot of triangles. Equilateral. Equilateral. If you had five sides, we'd get a regular pentagon. In the limit, what do you think is the best? If I give you a fixed curve, length, what do you think, sh what shape do you think gives you the most area? For a fixed length, what curve gives you the greatest area? Circle. So my wife was a graduate student at Wharton. I've got to be careful because this is being recorded. And they were building a great new home for the business school. What kind of office do powerful people like to have? Corner offices. And you can imagine what's going to happen when you have all these powerful distinguished professors, and now who gets which corner office? The building was a cylinder. There are no corner offices. I don't know if this was done to eliminate fighting. I kind of like to think as a mathematician, they realized that a circular building is going to give you more volume for the same surface area than a regular rectangular one. It is an interesting building to walk through as you actually go a significant amount because it is a good size. All right. How can we do this as a multivariable calculus problem? Well, we can write it as s of x, y <coughs> is x plus y minus 20 equals 0. That's the semi-perimeter. And then I can write my area function is just x times y. So this is basically my g. This is basically my f. So I need to calculate the gradient of f. So this is df dx, df dy. So what is df dx? Oh, sorry, I'm using the letter a. What is da dx? Because we need it to solve the problem. Oh, isn't it y? Yes. Yeah. Curious, how many people know the who's on first routine? Yeah. Considered by many the greatest comedy routine of all time. So da dx is just y. What is da dy? X. X. All right. Similarly, we have to calculate the gradient of s. So that'll be ds dx ds dy, and this is going to be fun. What's the gradient of s? What's the derivative of s with respect to x? What is the derivative of x plus y minus 20 with respect to x? 1. What's the derivative of x plus y minus 20 with respect to y? Also 1. Ah, the gradient of s does not depend on x and y. Wonderful. So now we have to solve our system of equations. We need x plus y minus 20 equals 0. We need grad f equals lambda grad, I'm sorry, grad a equals lambda grad s, which is the same as y equals lambda times 1, x equals lambda times 1. When you look at this equation, y equals lambda over 1, x equals y equals lambda times 1, x equals lambda times 1. What do you want to do to those two equations? 
So one is to equal them to each other. There's another thing you could do to them. To get rid of one of the variables, what could I do? I could divide. So can I just divide those two equations? Anything you might be slightly concerned about given that this is a math department? If the denominator is zero. If the denominator is zero. So I am doing this way overkill because I really want to just emphasize the points. So case one, x equals zero. So if x is zero, I can't divide by the second equation. Well, if x equals zero, what, then we know immediately that lambda equals zero, which then implies that y equals zero, which then implies that x plus y minus 20 equals negative 20, which is not zero. Contradiction. So when we have x equals zero, it doesn't satisfy the constraint. There's no way to satisfy the constraint and grad f is a multiple of grad g. Again, for this problem, it's a little bit of an overkill. You know y equals lambda times 1, x equals lambda times 1. You should just say x equals y. I want to just do this because for more involved problems, you will want to take ratios. And now let's do case 2. x does not equal 0. Ah, well, if x does not equal 0, then we get lambda equals x and y equals x. So then x plus y minus 20 equals 0. That just becomes 2x minus 20 equals 0, which just becomes x equals 10. And then from that, we get y equals 10. And that finishes the problem. So again, I am not going to go through how you would make sure that this is a maximum or a minimum. I'm not really going to talk about the second derivative test in several variables. It's much better once you know calculus, so once you know linear algebra. But I think we can all agree that for a problem like this, we're finding the maxima. We're not finding the minimum for a problem like this. Okay. Any questions on this problem? Yeah. Yes. Could you go over why the case one is zero? Well, just for, for case one, when you start going through the algebra, if we take x equals zero, we quickly get, oh, I should have written over here y equals zero, sorry. We get y equals zero. And then we have to satisfy the constraint x plus y minus 20 equals 0. But if x and y are both 0, then we get negative 20 equals 0. So there is no pair x, y, lambda that satisfies the three equations if x equals 0. And that means we only have to consider the case when x is not 0. All right. So what I want to do is I was asked to just talk briefly about the drowning swimmer. In the previous class, I actually had two lifeguards. Open people who have done that, anybody in this class? So for the drowning swimmer problem, if you were ever a lifeguard and you see someone drowning, what is your objective? Save them. Save them. How do you save them? Go to, them go to them as quickly as possible. And so for what we're doing, we may not actually go as quickly as possible, but we'll still go in a good way. And so here, is our lifeguard. Here is the drowning swimmer. I can always normalize things so that this is one unit. Once I do that, I don't know how far down I am, I'll call that A. I don't know how far up the swimmer is, I'll call that B. Any Monty Python fans? All right. What number is right out? Unless you proceed onward to... Too many questions. In the holy hand grenade of Antioch. So this is a possible path. I could run straight to the water and then go straight to the swimmer. This is idiocy. I am minimizing my time on land and maximizing my time in the water. You should run faster than you swim. This is bad. This should not be the optimal path. This is not a bad candidate. Maximize your time on land, minimize your time on water. There's one other natural candidate. So go directly. So and in fact, this will be the best solution if you run at the same speed you swim. More generally, I can run to some point x. 
And this is actually how rays of light refract between mediums. <coughs> and for each x that I run to, I can talk about what is the time it's going to take. Do we all agree that if I run to the left of zero, this is sheer stupidity? And if I run past one, I'm not going to overshoot. Well, maybe there's strong currents, but it's probably not a good idea to overshoot. So it seems like we're constrained in something like this, and we're not going to do some kind of strange spiral. So what you can do is you can calculate what is the time it takes to reach the swimmer as a function of where you run. And then you would look at the critical points, t prime of x equals 0. And you would also check the endpoints. And we're reasonably certain that this endpoint is not going to work, but this endpoint might be a winner. It turns out that the solution to this involves having to solve a quartic, a degree 4 polynomial. So there's a lot of really good math in this. And I love how good math enters in a really simple problem. Do you think lifeguards actually study calculus for problems like this? No. Why not? Yeah, I mean, if somebody's spending the time calculating where they should run. Now, you could, of course, just have things already pre-computed. So depending on where the person is, you've already done the calculus problem, so you know where. But for something like this, the amount of time we're saving is not really that much. They're not going to be that far out. You're not running that long. Just run straight to the person. Now, a situation where it really matters, you know, if a swimmer drowns, is this a big deal? No. You know, we've got lots of swimmers. But imagine it's a baseball game with playoff implications. If our runner doesn't get as many bases as possible, we could lose the game. So if you're just going for a single, you just run straight down the line to first base. And if you overshoot first base, it's not a big deal. What if you want to go for a double? Well, if you run like this and then have to make a hard turn, you know, in terms of your acceleration and whatnot, there's a lot of waste from that. And in fact, Professor Johnson here was involved in a project as to what is the optimal path to take if you want to go for second. And a lot of it is a function of when do you think you are going to start going to get a double. If you know from the beginning, you'll start off with a path like this. Maybe you don't know for a while, and then the first base goes, go for two, go for two. So for something like this, saving a few seconds or half a second is enormous and valuable. For the drowning swimmer, it's, it's not worth it. All right. And what I will end with is a problem for you guys to think about. So we're going to adjust the curriculum a little bit. I want to spend a little bit more time on optimization problems, because this is something you're going to really use. So imagine I give you some number s, maybe s is 100. And I want to write s as a1 plus a2 plus an. And is unknown each ai is a positive integer. And I want to maximize the product a1 times a2 all the way to times a n. It turns out this is actually a problem worth studying. This is not a strange cookbook problem. It has real world implications. And the solution involves almost everything from Calc 1 and Calc 2. It's amazing how much stuff we use. At least let's say Calc 1 from Calc 1. It's basically a review of all of Calc 1. And so we'll talk about this <coughs> on Wednesday. But let's look a little bit. Why do you think I'm requiring the a's to be positive? Yes. If there's a negative, it would just get smaller as you continue? Not necessarily. What, could I, what, what if I had negative 100, negative 100, plus 300? Then the sum is going to be 100, but I can make the product very large. I can add in negative 1,000 minus 1,000 plus 2,000. So I can make the product arbitrarily large if I allowed negative numbers. All right, so negative numbers are out. What would happen if I allowed zero? Yeah, the product would be zero. That's stupid. Is it possible that one of the A's could be one for the largest product? Yes. Uh, Why not? It would just multiply it by one, so it would add to the S, but it wouldn't do it. Yeah, so, so it would add to the S, but it wouldn't make the product any larger. So if you had a one, just blob it in with something else. So my question to you is, what is the best way to split up the number to maximize the product? And again, one of the things that's hard is n is unknown. We can generalize this. 
we can remove the word integer. And if we move the word integer, then the problem becomes really interesting. And then the last thing which I just want to mention, which we will hopefully talk about on Wednesday as well, is the arithmetic mean geometric mean. If I give you two numbers x and y, one way of taking their average is to just take the sum and divide by 2. I could also take the square root of the two numbers. So this is called the arithmetic mean. This is how we calculate your averages in classes. This is the geometric mean. They are both averages. And it turns out one of them is always greater than or equal to the other. How would you determine which one is always greater than or equal to if you know that one of them is always at least as large as the other? What would you do? Yeah, plug in numbers. If y equals 1 and x goes to infinity, this is going to x over 2. And this is going to the square root of x. So I know if it has to go in one way, it has to be this way. This is similar to what we were doing earlier today with the parabolas. If you have some idea of how things go, by looking at some special cases, you can fill in that knowledge. All right, so this is a good place to stop.